Hey there, and welcome back to Mass Effect 3. My name is Pete, and today we complete the first DLC mission of our Insanity walkthrough. Although with the Legendary Edition it is technically no longer DLC. In any case, today we complete Priority Eden Prime, which back in the original Mass Effect 3 was available as part of the From Ashes DLC. Now, it has been a while since the last episode, in which we completed our two-part tour of the Citadel, and we wrapped things up last time with some lengthy scenes from Blaster 6 Partners in Crime. That is also more or less the last thing we can do here on the Citadel, at least for the moment, so you can already watch us making our way back to the Normandy. So for the time being, we are going to leave the Citadel now, but I think we will be back shortly. And here we are, back on board, time for an update. I just got word. Everyone from Grissom Academy has arrived safely. We wouldn't have known about them if you hadn't caught the distress signal. Nice work. Thanks, Commander. That is nice to hear, and also all the talking we will do before jumping straight in. We will have time for a lengthy tour through the ship later. For now, let's get underway and travel to the Exodus Cluster, where the colony of Eden Prime is once again under attack, but this time from Cerberus, who have also uncovered a Prothean artifact in the process. Now, before we jump into the mission, please indulge me for just a brief planet scanning session. And despite the fact that we only have two systems to survey, this one is actually going to yield quite a lot. I found something. As you can see, in the Asgard system, one scan already reveals three points of interest, the first one allowing us to restock some of our fuel. Point of interest number two is the Nontir, and as always you can pause the video to read the descriptions at your pace. That will reveal that this planet is home to a few human and alien colonies, and scanning it allows us to recover the Alliance Naval Exploration Flotilla war asset. Moving on, we are then scanning the gas giant Boar, but not for a war asset. Instead, we can find some intel here to be used in Liara's office back on the ship. Now, despite all that, we are not done just yet. However, our second scan here already brings the Reapers into the system, which means we now have to act quickly. That brings us to Terra Nova, a human colony several million people strong. However, that was before being attacked by the Reapers. All on our own, we also can't do much to help, but we can acquire the Alliance Cruiser Shanghai as our war asset, and afterwards swiftly evade a Reaper in the area and then scan the planet Loki. By the way, yes, this is a fairly risky approach. If you want to play it safer, it might be wise to exit and re-enter the system. I believe that after a short while, the Reaper presence will also fade away. Now, we were lucky enough to secure an Alliance Spec Ops team as yet another war asset, and with that, we can now barely escape. Faster than light jump successful. Interestingly enough, in the Utopia system, we can then actually scan as much as we want. I believe that has something to do with the fact that a mission takes place here. And of course, the game does not want us to be unable to actually take that because we can't reach the planet it takes place on. With just the right positioning, you can however get both points of interest here with just a single scan. As you can see though, I was unable to do that and even failed with my second one afterwards. Eventually though, then we do get a signal from Zion, a gas giant that does actually have a small population of about a thousand people, likely the result of one or more fuel mining stations. In any case, we can scan it and obtain some Prothean data files, and with that another war asset. And with that, all of our prep work is completed, let's head over to Eden Prime once more. As you might remember, this is where our entire Mass Effect trilogy playthrough started, and you should be able to find that video linked on screen right now, but this time it looks like we'll be facing Cerberus and not the Geth. Now, interestingly enough, Liara has to come with us on this mission, and for old time's sake, and because he actually also fits quite well with her, we'll also take Garrus with us. Now, after our lengthy shopping spree, we now also have access to a plethora of new weapons and upgrades, but with Shepard at least, we'll keep it simple with the Maddock, upgraded with a damage bonus and some armor-piercing capabilities. Liara, meanwhile, will test out the Blood Pack Punisher SMG, and upgrade-wise, we also want to give her a damage bonus here, but in the last episode, we have also acquired a module that increases her power damage, and as our main biotic, I think it makes a lot of sense to put that on here. That very same logic then also applies to the Acolyte Heavy Pistol, which we are going to outfit in more or less the same fashion. 
Finally then we have Garrus who can test out the hard-hitting Chrysa sniper rifle, a weapon that actually shoots explosive rounds, and it actually also does a bit of extra damage against armored targets, and that can certainly be useful against the turrets that Cerberus engineers like to deploy. And because weight does not matter for our squad members, we can also give him the striker assault rifle as a backup weapon, but again, for the most part, Garrus will stick to the sniper rifle. And that's it, we will not be spending any squad points at this point. As a matter of fact, Garrus is the only one we could do that with anyway. Eden Prime, this is where it all began. Where the Prothean Beacon gave you the vision that warned us about the Reapers. And where Saren launched his first major attack with the Geth. Yes. And now, with Cerberus here, Eden Prime's colonists are under attack again. Seems like more than just three years ago. I remember the reports. I was busting my ass trying to find evidence against Saren. Hearing that he'd attacked a colony while I sat mired in bureaucracy, that was a bad day. And during this conversation, we can also obtain four quick Paragon points, so we'll pick the dialogue options at the top here two times in a row. You always did prefer a straight-up fight. And you're always good at helping me find them. Cerberus hit Eden Prime hard. Whatever they found here was worth a major offensive. There are survivors elsewhere on the colony, but they killed everyone near the dig site. They deserve better. I know. The Alliance did what it could to evacuate colonists, but Cerberus came in so quickly. If we find survivors, we'll do what we can. What about this artifact? Is it part of the Prothean device we found on Mars? The Alliance didn't get any specifics about what Cerberus has uncovered. But whatever it is, it's better off with us than with Cerberus. I'm bringing you in as close to the dig site as I can. No way we'll avoid detection, but you should have a few minutes. Appreciate it. All part of the service, Commander. All right, everyone. Get ready to move. With luck, we can get to the dig site before Cerberus knows we're here. No sign of survivors. Come on, we need to find the dig site. Right. This was a beautiful colony once. It survived, Saren. It can survive this. The city on Earth where I grew up was hard and dirty. I can see it as a war zone. Eden Prime doesn't deserve this. Nobody does. Look at that. Bits of Prothean tech sticking out of the ground like an old bone. So, Liara, ever dug up... Uh, what do humans call it? A dinosaur? No. Dinosaurs and other fossils would be paleontology. I'm an archaeologist. I study artifacts left by sapien species. The two fields are completely different, and... Uh, you were joking. A bit. But at least you're catching on these days. Right, so on the terminal here we find some internal Cerberus notes, revealing that they have unsurprisingly lied to the colonists of Eden Prime, and have in fact abducted numerous men and women, while telling those left behind that the others have just gone to a Cerberus research camp. Shepard, this Cerberus data could help the colonists still alive on other parts of Eden Prime. How? I can get this intel to Eden Prime's resistance. Maybe it will help them fight back against Cerberus. There. That's the elevator that leads down into the dig site. Goddess, that doesn't seem possible. It's not a Prothean artifact, it's... A Prothean. Like the Collectors, or those bodies we found back on Ilos? Like the bodies we found back on Ilos. This one is alive. You're right. That doesn't sound possible. You saw Prothean stasis chambers in the archives on Ilos. The only reason those failed was a lack of power. Cerberus found this in an underground bunker. It still has power. He's been in stasis for the past 50,000 years, waiting for us. Think of what we could learn. What can you tell me about the Protheans? The people, not the technology. Given your experience with the Prothean Cipher, you probably know as much about them as I do. The Prothean Empire spanned the known galaxy. They uplifted countless other species to help them join the galactic community. Hmm. 
Galactic community think they had something like a council? Yes, exactly. Their cultural and artistic expression are actually quite close to those of the ancient Asari. And given their similar interests in helping other species, it's clear that they believed in interspecies cooperation. Alright, I would say that is quite the find. And using the I'm curious about them option earlier allows us to now grab two more Paragon points here. The way you describe them, they sound a lot like the Asari. I'm certain I'm coloring their culture with my own perceptions. Whatever the Protheans were, finding one alive represents an incredible opportunity. And two more Paragon points can now be obtained by telling Liara that we're glad that she's here, although, again, we didn't really have a choice in that. Good thing we brought our Prothean expert. I hope I can help. If this single Prothean was sent into stasis, he could be the foremost scientist of his time, or perhaps the wisest counselor. Ah, <sighs> Cerberus damaged the life pod when they excavated it. The life signs are unstable. Then let's get him out of there. No, breaking open the pod would kill him. We have to find the command signal that ends the stasis mode. We also need to figure out how to physically open the pod without doing more damage. Cerberus took over the labs nearby to research what they found at the dig site. That's likely our best bet. There they are. Alright, combat time and we only have three enemies against us here, but those three can do some damage, as two of them are of the Nemesis class. They are wielding sniper rifles and on insanity difficulty those are extremely dangerous. As you can see here, just one shot strips away the entirety of our shields. Luckily for us though, they also don't have a lot of protection, especially once their shields are down, they are very flimsy, and so if we stay behind cover and don't expose ourselves too much here, they are fairly easy to take out. Alright, let's get moving before more of them come back. Now, at this point we have a choice to make because we have two objectives. Number one, we need to find the signal to end the stasis inside of the pod. And number two, we also want to find out how to actually open it without having to force it open. For that purpose, we are going to the left here first, but earlier we could have also entered the container on the right side. In any case, we now find another terminal entry revealing that Cerberus has pulled away most of their troops from the north, an information that could certainly help the locals. More intel to help the colonists. The more we find, the better chance they'll have. On the next desk here we can then also steal some Cerberus funds and then we can go back out to restock some ammunition and head onto the high ground as that will make the upcoming fight a lot easier. Now in the courtyard below us we have a few more Cerberus enemies including a turret that is already set up and waiting for us. This is also one of the reasons why we had it left first, because it now allows us to engage these enemies from above, something that would have been a bit more difficult had we chosen to go the other way around. And yes, we will be going in sort of a loop around the Cerberus camp here, with a few fights waiting for us at key intersections, and depending on where we come from, those fights can of course be tackled in different ways. Now, one interesting thing about this fight here is that a good number of the enemies in it are actually inside of that container marked number 2 in front of us, and they are unable to open the door. Sometimes they do manage to squeeze themselves around the outside, but they usually do that rather slowly and one enemy at a time, and we are not going to sit here and waste our time waiting for that. Instead, we can have our squad members keep their eyes peeled while we loot the container that we were just on top of, and if an enemy shows themselves in the meantime, then we will react accordingly. In the main container, we then also have the third and actually final piece of intel, this one showing that Cerberus has apparently turned a local doctor, and that they are using him to keep tabs on the Resistance Movement's plans. Perfect. This intel will give Eden Prime's resistance movement a real chance to push Cerberus out of their colony. Now, finding all three pieces of intel actually unlocks the Freedom Fighter achievement. That is, at least if you are playing the original Mass Effect 3, because in the Legendary Edition the achievement has sadly been removed. It also looks like our enemies have mostly been cleared out, but Liara would have given us a short line if they were all dead, so as we bypass the door into the container here we do want to be careful. And indeed, it looks like one enemy has been waiting for us. Luckily though, the Centurion's ambush here fails. There. That lab found footage of the Protheans. 
Cerberus is studying it to figure out how to physically open the pod. Grabbing the medkit here then also advances us to level 39. So before we complete our first objective, let's quickly take care of that. Although we only have enough squad points with Garrus, who we can advance to the fourth rank of Turian Rebel. And with Garrus, the choice between weapon damage and durability is usually an easy one. Especially in this game, he can become absolutely unstoppable. So let's give him that 40% weapon damage bonus. And with that, we can now proceed into the next container and use the computer console to find out how to open the pot. How many have we lost? Reaper forces have destroyed approximately 300,000 life pods. Third of our people. Alert! Northside bulkhead cannot be sealed. Hostiles detected. Then all forces to the north. I think I can duplicate that to open the life pod. You understood that? You didn't? No. All I saw was static. Cerberus was trying to make sense of it without success. The Prothean cipher you received on Pharos, it lets you see the images as a Prothean would and understand their language. Whatever it does, I saw the video. And how they sealed the life pods. Perfect. Then we just need the signal they use to activate stasis mode. So, it looks like what we just interacted with might be similar to one of those Prothean beacons. In any case, it appears as if we have now obtained enough information to open the pod. What we still need is the signal to deactivate the stasis mode. So that is now our next objective, for which we want to head into this container here, marked number 22. They were gunned down while having drinks and watching the game. This isn't a military stronghold. It's somebody's home. We didn't kill these people, and we're going to shut down the bastards who did. Got it! Affirmative! Now, as soon as we open the door here, things are once again getting heated, as the courtyard here once again has some enemies in it. Straight ahead of us and behind cover, we also have another turret, and as you can see, the engineers here are in the process of setting up another one. Luckily, we can lay down some fire and stop that from happening, otherwise this fight would become quite difficult. Now, one quick note, it is not necessary to engage the enemies head-on from this position here. We could also exit the container and loop around, which would then have us come in from the alley that is currently down to our right. That would of course shield us a bit better from the turret fire, but it also kind of messes with the rather linear one way through the entire camp approach, so we are sticking to this way here, which is admittedly a little bit harder. We are also making good progress, but this fight can at times drag out a bit, particularly when there are a lot of smoke grenades in play and the engineers do manage to set up that second turret. In that case, it would then also make some sense in my opinion to change tactics, but it looks like we got lucky here and did not face too much resistance. What we do have is one engineer who seems to be glitched and stuck to the ground, a nice target for us to increase our melee kill count. That lab found footage of the Protheans. Cerberus is studying it to find the stasis deactivation signal. Now, very importantly, before we head in, let's grab a few more credits from the desk over on the left here. These can easily be missed, and let's just say that on the way back out, things won't be quite as calm.
I never thought our empire would fall. It won't. We will sleep here until the Reapers return to dark space. Then we will rise, a million strong. For the Empire. For the Empire. Get to your stasis pod. Victory. Broadcast the stasis readiness signal to all life pods. And the refugees who have yet to reach the bunker. Their sacrifice will be honored in the coming Empire. Too? Yeah. I've got the signal the Protheans use to activate stasis mode. Excellent. Then we have everything we need to open the pod. Backup forces are here. Alright, we've got company, as Cerberus is dropping off a few troopers and guardians. But as you know, anything unshielded is really not much of a threat to us, as Liara's singularity makes quick work of even the guardians. The one engineer in the group does manage to set up their turret though, but at least in theory that can be avoided as well, although in my opinion for this fight it doesn't change too much. Now moving on, we immediately head from one fight into another as we open the door to the next container here. Now as you saw it is also possible to take the path down to the right and loop around, but that would bring us face to face with not one but two turrets and usually that is something that we want to avoid. Doing it this way we have a bit more cover for ourselves and can pick off one enemy after the other, once again getting good use out of the fact that concussive shots projectiles have target seeking capabilities. You may have noticed though that there is a bit of commotion going on to our right, where Garrus and Liara have so far been able to hold their position, but unfortunately not to keep the engineer from setting up another turret. With their help though we can quickly take care of that problem and also of its creator and then we very carefully want to move forward as we do have another turret waiting for us around the corner. Still knowing that it's there is already half the plan and with some careful positioning it doesn't present too much trouble. Retracted the bridge. We have to find another way across. Now, in case you haven't noticed, we have just come back to where we started, although it looks like we have to take a small detour to get back to the pod. Luckily, though, for now, there are no more enemies in sight, and we actually already have all that we need to open the pod and extract who's in it, so the end of this mission might be fast approaching. Of course, though, knowing how missions are usually structured in this game, you might already anticipate a bit of a twist coming up here, and rightfully so. I'm transmitting the signal. Perfect. It'll take a few moments for the life pod to process it. Heavy Cerberus forces inbound. Looks like we've got a siege on our hands. Right away! Acknowledged! Okay, so it looks like we are not done here just yet, as Cerberus appears to be mounting for one final attack to stop us. We do have the advantage of a pretty defensible position though, keeping a lot of open ground between us and our attackers. Those attackers also overwhelmingly consist of assault troopers and with that present a challenge mainly due to their numbers and not because of their individual strength. For the most part though, the distance between us and them keeps us safe, as long as we stay in cover they are simply too far away to do any sort of meaningful damage, while singularity and concussive shot hit just as hard no matter how far away the enemies are. As a result, our main issue during this fight is actually to stay on top of our ammunition, which as you can see has more or less run out. That is surely the one big downside of using this one weapon approach with Shepard, but then again for the most part the game is fairly generous with ammunition and we also always have concussive shot to fall back to no matter how many rounds we still have in our magazine. Still, this section of the fight likely could have been solved a little bit faster had we not spent most of our ammunition in the fight before. Looks like we've got a second to catch our breath. If anybody needs fresh clips or a bathroom break, now's the time. Has the life pod ended stasis mode? We're almost there. You got it. I saw a supply cache in the building next door if you want to stock up. I can lay down a singularity to block enemy access. Right, so it looks like we are waiting for one more wave to come in and for this one we want to stay inside. 
Okay, so we now have the interesting task of having to deal with a heavy mech while Cerberus is unloading troops all around us. And while we focus all of our attention on the mech here and keep our flank secure with Garrus and Liara, I briefly want to talk about a few other strategies that you can employ here. First of all, if you remember that rooftop that we had to use briefly to get back to the pod, that would now be an ideal spot with a great overview of the battlefield, and most importantly, one that the mech cannot access. Alternatively, just quickly grabbing the ammunition from the container here and then returning to the pod would have the mech spawn in a different location, with a bit more open ground to cover. Most importantly, it would also keep our flank secure, as there is currently only one way to get onto the platform. So in some ways, it might look like we have actually chosen the hardest road here, but hunkering down inside of course also has its advantages, namely the fact that the mech cannot enter the container, and that there are plenty of cover spots and choke points to go around. As a result, we have been able to take out the mech relatively unscathed, and now only have to deal with the various assault troopers still roaming around. This can admittedly get a bit tricky, because there are multiple entrances into the container, and we have also once again run out of ammunition. Luckily though, there is some on the table in the back here, however, it is also accompanied by a number of enemies already waiting for us. This appears to be the final small group though, so once they are taken out, we should have the battlefield cleared, which means we can then hopefully finally open the pod. Once again, we will receive a short voice line from Liara to tell us when we're ready, but of course we can also use the compass in the lower right corner to tell us how many enemies are left and also where they're hiding. And since we are only dealing with stragglers at this point, we might as well use that. After all, every melee kill helps us to get one step closer towards the bruiser achievement. At this point then, we are returning to the pod, because that is where the last enemy is hiding, and once they are down, we can then finally open it, and treat ourselves to one of the more interesting cutscenes in this series. There, you can open the life pod now. There, you've got it. It may take him some time to fully regain consciousness. Careful, he's confused. Remember, it's been 50,000 years for us, but for him, it's only been... A few minutes! No, the bunker is falling. There is no other option. There are pods online! Those soldiers are still alive! Their sacrifice will be honored in the coming Empire. Preparing neutron bombardment. Get to your life pod now!
about us? Just you. <clears throat> you can understand me? Yes. Now that I've read your physiology, your nervous system, enough to understand your language. So you were reading me while I was seeing... Our last moments. Our failure. And yes indeed, we have just awoken a life-breathing Prothean, and we are welcoming him the only way we can, with two Paragon Points. Your people did everything they could. They never gave up. And I could use some of that commitment now. Shepard, whatever you did got Cerberus interested. Asari. Human. Terrian. I am surrounded by primitives. It's not safe here. Will you join us? You fight the Reapers? Yes. Then we will see. A living Prothean. That's correct, Admiral. But he's not quite what we expected. Commander, our scientists barely understand what they need to do here. If the Prothean can help us construct this device, we need his cooperation. Understood, Admiral. We're losing colonies faster than we can evacuate. We've never seen a force like the Reapers. He has, Admiral. Can he help us? I intend to find out. Good. Cerberus slipped up and gave us a new weapon. Don't let it go to waste. Hack it out. Shepard, I need you down in the port cargo hold. It's about our new guest. I'm on my way. What's the problem? I've tried to make the room more accommodating, but they're not letting me talk to him. Apologies, Doctor. Contact protocol with a new species. Assume hostility. We had to dust off the regulations. But he's not new. I've spent my life studying Protheans. Now, there are no morality points to be obtained here, and honestly, it might make some sense to be careful. Still, let's show ourselves open and trusting. Perhaps that can help us gain the Protheans favor. At ease. I don't think our guest will be a problem. Will he? That depends on you. I can sense fear in you. Anxiety and distress. The Reapers are winning. What do you mean, you sense? All life provides clues for those who can read them. It is in your cells, your DNA. Experience is a biological marker. Then what exactly did I experience back on Eden Prime? That was a hell of a flashback. The battle left its own mark on me. I communicated this to you. It can work both ways. Like your beacons? Yes. Which... You found one. You saw it all. Our destruction. Our warnings. Why weren't they heeded? Why didn't you prepare for the Reapers, human? It's Commander. And nobody could understand your warnings. The beacon nearly killed me. Then communication is still primitive in this cycle. We pieced together what we could, and used it to stop a Reaper invasion three years ago. Then the extinction was delayed. Now we have your plans for the device. We're going to build it. Device? The weapon your people were working on. I'd hoped you could tell us how to finish it. We never finished it. It was too late. Then I take it you don't know anything about the Catalyst? No. I was a soldier, not a scientist. Skilled in one art. Killing. What was your mission? Among my people, 
There were avatars of many traits, bravery, strength, cunning, a single exemplar for each. Which are you? The embodiment of vengeance. I am the anger of a dead people, demanding blood be spilled for the blood we lost. Only when the last Reaper has been destroyed will my purpose be fulfilled. I have no other reason to exist. Those who share my purpose become allies. Those who do not become casualties. And once again, this looks like the prototypical morality choice, but it actually isn't. Nonetheless, I don't think that our shepherd would agree with this stance. And even if he would, I highly recommend picking this option anyway, as it results in arguably one of the best lines in the entire game. Nothing in our fight against the Reapers has been that cut and dried. Because you still have hope that this war will end with your honor intact. I do. Stand in the ashes of a trillion dead souls and ask the ghosts if honor matters. This silence is your answer. We found this at the dig site. I assume it belongs to you. It is a memory shard. Could it help us with the device? No. It contains only pain. But I will help you fight. And the last thing the Reapers hear before they die will be the last voice of the Protheans sending them to their grave. If you don't mind, I have a few more questions I'd like to ask. Here it comes. I've written over a dozen studies on your species. I've published in several journals that... Amusing. Asari have finally mastered writing. I'm sorry? Never mind. What do you wish to know? Now, unsurprisingly, we do have some questions at this point, and this will of course take a while, but this right here might actually be one of the most interesting sources of information in the entire galaxy at this point, so let's dig in as deep as we can. What can you tell us about your own war with the Reapers? Many of the details were lost. The conflict lasted for centuries. Those that faced the Reapers in the beginning were long dead when I was born. There were memory shards, however, passed down from soldier to soldier. They gave us fragments of what happened. How did your people wage war against the Reapers? Attrition. We fought them system by system, planet by planet, city by city. Entire worlds were sacrificed just to slow the Reapers down. The time they spent harvesting a population was time we could regroup. That must have cost you in the long run. Yes. Our own people would be indoctrinated, converted, then turned against us. But there was no choice. Mercy is not a weapon. It is a weakness. Why do you think your own cycle lost the war? What had been our strength, our empire, became a liability. All races conformed to one doctrine. One strategy. The Reapers exploited this. Once they found our weaknesses, we could not adapt. The subservient races became divided and confused. Then, it was only a matter of time. I'm happy to say our cycle is different. Most races cooperate, but they still remain unique. Then it may be your only hope. Several years ago, we found a Prothean VI that called itself Vigil on the planet Ilos. He was the caretaker of a research project. During my life, Ilos was only a rumor. It was said we had cities there, built on the ruins of a civilization before us, the Inusanon. If our scientists did have a research facility, whatever they were doing was secret. Yes, Vigil said they wiped all traces of themselves from the records so the Reapers couldn't find them. The scientists eventually went into cryogenic stasis. More of my people survived? No. But they did stop the Reapers from taking control of the Citadel in this cycle. It delayed their invasion. I never saw the Citadel. It was captured long before I was born. Back on Eden Prime, it looked like there were other stasis pods. What happened? The Empire had fallen, and we knew our cycle was lost. We were the final vanguard, the best soldiers left alive. So more of you were supposed to survive into this cycle? Yes. Under my leadership, a new Prothean Empire would have arisen. 
we would have commanded the races of your time to prepare for the next Reaper invasion. But traitors within our ranks, indoctrinated agents, betrayed us, and the Reapers discovered our plan. Just out of curiosity, how would you have commanded us? By leaving you no other option. You would have joined our army, or faced the Reapers alone. We've uncovered quite a few Prothean ruins. Were you observing our ancestors? Before the war, we cultivated species who showed potential. Eventually, you would have been offered a choice to join the Empire. But when the Reapers attacked, we ceased all study. We hoped they would see you as too primitive to harvest. Well, thank you. I think. Is there anything more you can tell us about this device your people were trying to build? We heard only stories. They said our scientists were constructing a great machine that had the power to defeat the Reapers. You never saw it? By that point, the Empire was smashed into pieces. None of us knew what the others were doing. Well, if we don't finish it soon, the same will be true of us. Liara here would never forgive me if I didn't ask you. What was Prothean civilization like? Yes, I've always wondered. What sort of government did you have, and can you tell me about your religious beliefs, or perhaps the- We are dead now. What does it matter? I'm sorry. Studying your history has been a lifelong passion of mine. When I was born, our empire was already at war with the Reapers. The first thing I remember was seeing my planet on fire. What was your civilization like before the Reaper attack? We were the dominant race of our cycle. We ruled the galaxy. My studies indicated you were the only race engaged in space travel at the time. I always found that curious. We were one empire composed of many subjects. All eventually called themselves Prothean. What if they didn't want to? They weren't given a choice. Are you saying you enslaved the other species? Any could oppose us if they wished. And if they had won, they would have ruled. Many tried. None succeeded. I had no idea Protheans were so... severe. It was by necessity. Very early we encountered the dangers posed by machine intelligence. They rebelled against us. We've had the same problem. They're called Geth. We could not allow the machines to surpass us. It was decided the only way to win was to unite all organic life within our empire. Did it work? For a time. The Metacon War. We were turning the tide. Until the Reapers arrived. Then we understood machines had surpassed us long ago, in ways we could never imagine. We've never seen a species with this sensory ability you have. It was common among my people, imparting experience through touch, the chemistry of life. Complicated ideas could be absorbed in seconds. That sounds very useful. We evolved as hunters. Reading a thousand details in our environment ensured our survival. So could you read something about this room? There was liquid, a form of incubation. The DNA of a Krogan who lived here. He was powerful, prone to violence. I'm impressed. His name was Grunt. And if he were my enemy, I would have given him a wide berth. There is great strength in his genes. I'm beginning to understand the beacons a bit more. Later, we developed technology to harness our ability. Information could be stored in certain objects through touch. Memory has its own biomarker, its own chemistry, as do knowledge and skills. The beacons could remember these things. Things like Reaper invasions. Yes, I can still sense the turmoil in you. Witnessing the extinction of our empire. The fabric of your being was forever marked that day. Alright, that was certainly a lot to unpack there. But for the time being, our conversation has come to an end. So let's leave our new guest to himself. Thank you for talking with me. I never imagined actually meeting a Prothean. This has been amusing. Oh? To discover the most primitive races of my time now rule the galaxy. The Asari, the humans, the Turians. There's also the Salarians. The lizard people evolved? I believe they're amphibian. They used to eat flies?
Commander, you may count on me. I am known as Javik. Then welcome aboard the Normandy, Javik. And there we go, we have unlocked the Prothean Expert achievement and the Particle Rifle, and can now get a few more short lines out of Javik. So much has been lost, so much has changed, and yet the Reapers are still here. For me, it was only yesterday. Our empire spanned the galaxy. Now we are only a myth. I still have much to learn about this cycle. Right, so moving on from our Prothean guest, we can now head over to engineering, because during our last Citadel visit, we pardoned engineers Daniels and Donnelly. So, Gabby, have you seen Edie's new body? Ah, oh, I knew this was coming. I just mean, it's an amazing work of engineering. Elastic titanium silicon polymers, ultra light harmonic phased power cells. Mm hmm. And if she ever accidentally walks into a wall, there's just so much padding. Ugh, I knew it. Wish I were a wall. You pretty much are, Kenneth. Commander, thank you. It's great to be back. It feels good to be in an Alliance uniform again. Welcome aboard, Chief. Commander. And we can also have a brief chat with Engineer Adams to find out what he thinks about the new company. Need anything, Commander? How's Engineer Daniels working out? Her, I like. She's sharp and knows propulsion theory better than most physicists I've met. And she's easy to work with, too. Always said you had an eye for talent. Good job bringing her back to the Alliance. How's Engineer Donnelly working out? The kid's got talent. Now if he could just learn to shut his damn mouth. Problems? I'm sorry, Commander. Donnelly is dedicated, knowledgeable, and thinks on his feet. I'm glad to have him on my team. Could use a lesson or two about respecting chain of command, but I've handled the likes of him before. No need for concern. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, sir. And as we are about to leave, we can catch one more short conversation. I'm glad the Commander didn't forget about us down here. I told you Shepard would come visit. Up next, we can now stop by Diana Alice's newsroom, although she doesn't really have much to say, at least not to us. Have you seen our newest crew member? You mean the biggest story in 50,000 years that I can in no way talk about? So yeah, I've seen him. Just wondering. Cerberus stealthily strikes star system Sheol. No, glad I read that one out loud. That completes our tour of the engineering deck, which means we can now head back to the elevator, with our next stop being the shuttle bay. And one thing that we notice here immediately is that Cortez is no longer where he usually is. Everything okay with the shuttle? Just double checking the inertia dampener coils. It can be twitchy in these UT-47s. But don't worry, this bird's been rock solid. I always see you down here working your ass off. Ever take any downtime? I get my sleep, Commander. Flying tired is nearly worse than flying drunk. What about your waking hours? Any R&R? &R? I need to keep myself busy. Otherwise, well, too much time to think. Now, two easy Paragon points can be obtained by telling Cortez not to work too hard, even though it's probably good for him to have something to focus on. I appreciate your dedication, but I don't want to see you burn out. I know my limits. I wouldn't take a chance with your life. So before this war, you must have done something to relax. Sure. I remember back when the Hawking was based out of Arcturus and I was just a fighter jock. There was this observation deck overlooking the main flight paths. You could watch every ship taxi in and out. When I was alone, I'd turn off the auditory emulators and just watch them drift by in silence. You know the reviews like that on the Citadel. Next time we're there, you should take some shore leave. Clear your head. I don't know. Maybe. At this point, we can now actually use a charm option to get him to take some time off. Unlike the two options on the right, this does not earn us any morality points, but as we know, it's the guaranteed way to get results. Take some time off on the Citadel, Steve. As a favor to me. I find it very hard to say no to you, Shepard. As it should be. Sir. All right, and with two Paragon points and two points of reputation earned, let us now continue. After all, James probably also has some thoughts on our new guest. 
I still can't believe it. A real live Prothean. <laughs> Doc must be over the moon. You could say that. I hear the guy's not all there, exactly. Damn, <laughs> I can't imagine. Brought forward 50,000 years, last of your kind. That's bound to screw with your mind. Yeah. Well, here's hoping he can help us with the Reapers. I'll bet the elusive man's boiling in his brandy right about now. Took that Prothean right out from under him. So, Anderson and Sanders. That's quite a couple. Huh. My dad's last name is Sanders. No relation. Quick call back here to our mission at Grissom Academy, and that is also all we can do down here, so let's head back up again. This time we are heading up to the crew deck, where I'm pretty sure Liara will still be sitting in amazement. Excellent find, Commander. The information network terminal has been updated. And yes, during our travels we have obtained two more pieces of intel to be used here, starting with a weapon upgrade kit. We can now cash that in for either an ammo capacity or a weapon damage bonus, and despite the fact that we have run out of ammunition a few times during the last mission, we are going for the damage bonus, as this of course extends to our squad members as well, for whom ammunition is totally irrelevant. Using the remains of a Reaper Destroyer, we could then theoretically obtain a store discount bonus, and this actually applies to every single store in the game. However, because money is really not an issue in this game, as long as we play through the Citadel DLC, we are instead going with a power cooldown bonus. Up next, we can now take a quick look at Liara's broker terminal, starting with a rather short entry, as Liara has apparently already started taking notes on Javik, and we will likely be able to read a lot more about him here in the coming episodes. In the other message, then, we learn that Kasumi Goto has apparently stolen a one-of-a-kind point-to-point communication server, and that she has given it, alongside a sizable sum of Cerberus credits, to an astrophysicist, who seems to be more than happy about this support for their work. A Prothean. A living, breathing Prothean right below me. He's not what I expected. Me neither. He was a little... cold when I tried to talk. I understand the shock of waking up again. His species gone. But a Prothean Shepherd? There's so much he could tell us. And yes, despite all she has already been through, this might very well be one of the biggest moments in Liara's life. So it is more than understandable, I think, that she is a bit giddy at the moment. Moving on, we can now pay a visit to our second squad member for this mission and see how Garrus feels. I've seen a lot of crazy things in my time on the Normandy, Shepherd. A talking Reaper, a talking plant, and now a real live talking Prothean. Hell of a thing, waking up to find everything you know is destroyed. But I imagine the chance to get some payback is consolation. Doubt you and I will ever get a second chance against the Reapers. What do you suppose the Prothean eats? What if it's boiled asari with a side of fried Turian? I don't know about Liara, but I'm not taking that one for the team. If this war goes south, maybe we could freeze you for 50,000 years, Shepard. You could go from being merely famous to legendary. Alright, and with that we are also done here, and that means it is time to return to the CIC. A few more very short conversations await us, but we are more or less at the end here. on Eden Prime. First the Geth attack, now Cerberus. For what it's worth, our new crew member doesn't need a translator himself, but he shared a Prothean language tutorial program. It was apparently designed for servant races being inducted into the Empire. Charming cultural clue. Charming indeed, that is certainly one attribute that I would not describe Javik with, but then again he has been in stasis for 50,000 years, so maybe we should cut him some slack. So a Prothean, a real live Prothean. Has Liara stopped bouncing yet? I'm guessing there may have been some bouncing. How's our new visitor adjusting to the ship, Edie? He appears not to understand the human custom of separate sex restroom facilities. I am attempting to enlighten him. I will update you if there is positive progress. Uh, how about you just update me if he doesn't get the message? Very well. And so indeed, more or less the entire crew seems to be very occupied with our new guest, 
It's a bit of a shame actually that Dr. Chakwas does not have any lines about him, especially considering that pretty much every other person on board has. Be that as it may, we do have one last thing to take care of, and that is to read a few messages, starting with another one from Arya, who once again invites us to the Citadel to talk about Omega. That is DLC business though, so we'll hold off on it for the moment. This next message here then confirms that we have actually completed our small submission on Eden Prime, as we have apparently collected enough intel for the local resistance movement to successfully push Cerberus off of the planet. This actually also gives us another war asset, you may have noticed that pop up after we collected the third piece of intel. Finally then, we have some good news from Caden, who appears to be feeling much better and seems to be ready to leave the hospital soon. So that is one more reason to return to the Citadel, although I think in the next episode we will first drive the game's main plot forwards. We have let that one slide a bit in the last episodes, after all there is still a war summit to complete. So that is likely what we are going to do next time. For today though, I think we have reached the end and can make the cut at this point. So as always, if you enjoyed the episode, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.